Welcome to the Compassionate Workplace session. Uh, we've got several interesting speakers today. Uh, and it's, as you know, the compassion is the main theme of this year's Festival of Faiths. And it's also Greg Fisher's one of his key initiatives. He's been driving there for the last couple of years very successfully. And now he's gonna just drive it through the rest of the business community. We'll make it very successful there. And what really is compassion in the workplace? It means different things to different people. It's implemented in different uh, companies uh, appropriate for their company. It could be internal things, it could be service days, it's all kinds of ways in empowering people to do better things. Uh, but it has one thing in common, and that's basically that the company establishes the values and it becomes part of their culture. They believe in respect, they believe in trust, they believe in honesty, being straightforward, caring about people, and all those factors, what happens there, it makes a much stronger team, much stronger entity, and it's actually good for the business, it's good for productivity, it's good to, for achieving whatever mission you're trying to achieve. So actually, compassion in the workplace with those values is a way to make the business more successful in whatever it does. Um, and it's also across all industries. It's not, it's not just one particular industry that needs compassion. As long as you have human beings in your company, compassion in the workplace is a good model to make you more successful. Uh, and it's also not an either or thing. It's not like, well, I don't want to be compassionate, but I want to be you know, successful, competitive, profitable. If you're compassionate, again, you build stronger teams, better company, better customer relationships, more trust, which all results in, again, better output, better productivity, better profitability. So they really do go hand in hand. And it's also not about avoiding the tough issues, whether it's business issues or personnel issues, any of those things. The key is deal with those issues, deal with reality, but always go back to your core values and don't ever compromise on the respect, the trust, the honesty, et cetera, that I mentioned earlier on. Um, and today, what Greg wants to do is get the business leaders in the community to start spreading the word, speaking about this. He's, he's talked about this a lot, many, many times, to many, many groups. He's trying to get the business leaders who are in a position to help spread this throughout their own business. And then it's part of not only that business culture, but part of, the, part of the business culture of the community to make Louisville a more successful and better place to live. Uh, and I want to introduce the sponsor and the moderator. And we actually couldn't get a better combination. Uh, Hospice as a company is a model of compassion. Uh, they basically, for the most part, take care of people in the end of life stages, which is critical for families as well as the individuals. And um, they also do that regardless of people's ability to pay. I, I know this, uh, my mother, uh, the last few months of her life back in 1990, the company was called Hospice back then. Uh, they helped her tremendously and they helped everybody, helped the family. And you know, the end of life is, is part of a celebration of a, a great human life in, in, in most cases, hopefully. And what, what hospice does, it helps to bring out that love, that kindness, that spirituality, and help them face the next step of life. And in her case, she was looking forward to you know, seeing my father, he, who died you know, many years before that. But hospice was tremendous in bringing that love and that kindness to our family. We'll never forget that. And the other part of that is that um, hospice is a great example for compassion, but, uh, but Phil Marshall, who's the CEO and president of, that, of hospice, and hospice, is actually himself a great model. And I can talk about, you know, kind of what he is from his resume, which is not that important compared to who he is, but just on the what side, he's the immediate past chair of the Bluegrass chapter of the Young Presidents Organization International, which is a big deal. He's on the board of the Health Enterprise Network. Um, he's been in several different leadership positions, the Kentucky Association of Hospice and Palliative Care. Uh, recently elected to the National Hospice Work Group, which is a very significant uh, accomplishment. And he's been executive director at the Norton Healthcare Foundation and the CEO of Healing Place in Louisville. And those are all kind of, kind of what Phil is, but. But the who Phil is, is described, you know, well, number one, he's the one that his leadership brought um, uh, Hospice, the first company to be the uh, compassionate healthcare organization in Louisville. But secondly, his employees describe most accurately the kind of who he is. And they say he's a very wise and skillful businessman who works from the heart. And based on that, I'd like to introduce Phil Marshall of Hospice, who will moderate the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. First of all, I want to thank the mayor. Uh, I remember sitting at the Henry Clay and, and listening to you announce, I'm not sure that was the first time, but it was the first time I heard it, and I kind of wanted to get up and raise my arms and say, I want to be part of this. 
Uh, we really do want to be a lot of this and part of it. And so the Festival of Face, I think for Hosperus, uh, is one of the best venues, if not the best venue for us to hear about compassion in the community. Really, that is, of our core values, compassion is the first core value at Hosperus. It's compassion, accountability, respect, empowerment, and then that all leads to service above and beyond. But compassion's on the top. And so every day, we were one of the early hospice organizations to form in the country, right here in your community, back in 1978 as Hospice of Louisville. And then we were an innovator in that we merged in Shelbyville, Central Kentucky, Southern Indiana, and now Barron River, which is the Bowling Green area. So the quickest way to describe what we are is your community hospice starting north of Henryville, Indiana, all the way to the Tennessee border now. And we're helping 900 patients and families. And why is that significant? Because we're trying to bring compassion, grace to the family, and we've doubled in size in the last five years. That means more families are accessing end-of-life care. That stigma, hopefully, is beginning to melt away. We all need to do a better job of trying to bridge that gap, and Joe's going to talk about that today on the, the nursing facility side and home care, and how do we blend that. That's the real challenge in health care. But thank you for letting me be a part of this today. Um, we have 500 employees that are out trying to help those families in 33 counties, several of which are here, and we're just blessed to be part of this. So it's my job to introduce the mayor. We did that at lunch, but I'm going to add a couple things to that. Uh, Kevin mentioned just a minute ago that I was chair of our Young Presidents organization. So the mayor preceded me in that by a few terms, but I think that was definitely the hardest and most challenging um, leadership job I've ever had. 90 young presidents from our community of, of uh, sizable companies. So I learned more from that experience and I actually uh, did touch base with the mayor several times in my tenure trying to lock us more into what the city was doing in the compassion side. Uh, also with the mayor, the other surprise was that he's been involved in stadiums, the Dan Clayton and all that. That's fascinating to me. I want to learn more. I learn something about you every day. And finally, the Science Center. I knew you were involved, but $25 million? How come we didn't have you on our board before? So uh, introduce the mayor. Well, thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. Uh, Phil and Hospice are the real deal. It's interesting as I talk to different business folks, some of them talk about service and compassion, and they kind of get the, there's many stages of it. I don't know how many stages, but you know, the first stage is just kind of doing volunteer work and that type of thing. But what Hospice does, and that you're a genuine, authentic guy that's really putting it to practice, and it's a it's impressive and inspirational to see. And if there's a bunch of Hospice employees here, you guys are a great company to have in our city. And we're really, really proud of the work that you guys do. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> so just a couple of introductory remarks they asked me to give. So I'm a business guy that happens to be mayor. And it was interesting when I was running for mayor, this is for some of y'all that aren't from Louisville, can take this back to your cities. People kind of ridiculed me to say, you know, who is this guy? He has no political experience. He shouldn't be running for mayor because you need to be a politician. You need to have political experience. And I said, no, this is more of a chief executive's job. You need to set goals. You need to lead. You need to inspire. You need to know how to manage. And that's what I've done uh, my whole life. So now I'm into this job about two years. So I can report back that it is like much, much more important to have the leadership and management skills in terms of an executive position like a mayor than it is to be a so-called expert politician, you know, which has all these connotations of... <laughs> well, because it's about getting things done. perfect, but we've got to keep moving this enterprise forward. And by doing that, we can learn more every day. So it's like turning the improvement wheel.
turn it, reflect, improve, turn it again. So, mayor, what's the job of a mayor? Got to have the, have the head of an entrepreneur and a chief executive, and you got to have the heart of a social worker. Because we're dealing with the full bell curve of life as a mayor. You know, you can't tell somebody, no, I don't want you to be my supplier. No, I don't want you to be my customer. Everybody is a customer in the mayor's office. This is really stimulating, I gotta tell you. <laughs> you know, I like to be busy. I like to help people. I like complex uh, challenges. So mayor is a good, uh, good thing to do. But uh, we talk about compassion in business and it's a concept that you, it's easy to get your head around when you start thinking about it. Because for instance, we talk a lot about education. So is raising, graduate, gradu is raising graduation rates, for instance, in a city, is that a compassionate thing to do? Or is it good for business? Obviously it's both, right? How about health and fitness? And is that a good thing for the community? Is it a compassionate thing for a community? Or is it good for business and it's good for the city? It's obviously both, right? How about uh, violent crime? reducing crime of any kind, is that a compassionate thing to do or is it good for business? So obviously I'm, I'm kind of saying obvious things here, but let's think about improvement through the lens of compassion. And it's not some kind of touchy-feely, liberal thing to do, or I guess conservatives would say it's compassionate as well. I don't know, I never did understand that, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> and, and how about like interfaith gatherings? You know, is that compassionate or is it good for business or good for the business of the city? I'd say it's both, right? Because ultimately what we're all trying to do is understand what motivates all of us and then how we can be part of raising our collective good as a city. As I mentioned over lunch, how do we bring out this tremendous potential that's inside all of us? Imagine you know, if we had this city Whereas Thomas Merton said, and I said earlier, we're literally, everybody was walking around like the sun was shining on them because every gift that they have was pouring forth every day. What a sensory overload that would be for a city. So how do we do that in our businesses? And as a business guy, uh, co-founded a company in 1980. In 1997, we were a finalist for the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. So that's like the Nobel Prize for business. It's really hard to do. But the way that we did it was by honoring the potential that was in each of our team members, each of our employees. And you do that by meeting them wherever they happen to come from and then providing the training and the practice and the skill development and being there with people when they're like, I'm not sure I can do this because a lot of people enter the workplace, whether it be for-profit or non-profit, with self-esteem that's not developed because everybody's got a story. And some of the stories include backgrounds of, uh, it could be abuse of some kind or another. Horrible relationships that they come out of that when you see them as a person, you just see kind of this physical vessel, but you don't know what their background is. So not everybody comes in to the workplace with joy in learning and joy in achievement. So I think that's part of our jobs in business is to let people discover that joy. And then if they're lucky, like me, I say I've never worked a day in my life because I've always had joy at what I've done. So how can we get everybody on a path like that? So does that make me a soft business guy that's out of touch with reality? Or does that make me, hmm, maybe I understand something here where then these people, all of a sudden they came in and said, you know, I only work with my hands. That's not my job. You don't hear that in a compassionate workforce. A compassionate workplace is an entrepreneurial workplace because people just say, what do I need to do? How can I help? And then how have we provided them the tools so they can meet opportunity with preparation and really go on? Now the fun thing about this as a compassionate company is that you beat the Neanderthal command and control style of managers all day long. And these are typically the tough guys. You know, that they feel like, and it's usually guys, by the way, sorry guys, sorry to <laughs> tell you this. But you know, they feel like, 
every decision has to come through them. Well, all that's a reflection of is you have not trained your people. Because the competitive advantage of any company is the infinite interactions of the hundreds or thousands of people that you work with. So how do you train your organization to take advantage of those interactions to develop value in some way that makes your value proposition as a company unlike any other? So there's some real intentionality that goes into this process. And the two more, most important things for a chief executive, and I'll close on this, is one, what does your company stand for? In other words, what's the culture of your company? What are your values and your beliefs? So that you're sending up a clear signpost that if you believe in these things, come and work with us. If you don't, find an organization that reflects your personal values and beliefs. Because I totally reject this notion of I'm a good person that goes to church every Sunday or Saturday or Friday. But then when things come to business, well, business is different. Let me tell you the hundred ways I'm going to screw you. That's not acceptable in my world. We're the same person seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So how do we get that alignment in the values and beliefs of a company and a person? That's number one thing for the chief executive is to define them, model them, and be pretty compassionate, yet very strong and clear on acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And if people don't want to be at your organization, no problem, but help them find another place. And then the second is to develop, architect a business system then that allows these values and beliefs to come alive in people. So like a value and belief is we're going to be the best at whatever we do. Somebody's got to be the best, right? So why not go on that journey? And the best just means, again, optimizing your potential as an individual and your ability to deliver value to a customer. That requires study, it requires lifelong learning, it requires joy in that task. It requires the joy in man managing interactions between you and your fellow uh, person. Uh, teamwork is a value. Dignity, respect, these are all values as well. So once those are in place, how do we develop our business systems so that we make sure that people get the training, they're developing as leaders and followers. We know how to interact with each other both functionally and cross-functionally, and that we're obviously connected in with the customer. So if a good chief executive has architected a very robust, intentional business system, and then has this values and beliefs. And then all you do as chief executive then is you just make sure those are improving all the time. And if you do that, a compassionate organization comes out of it. And the benefit of that, obviously, is you're able to provide a better value to somebody that's going to do business with you than anybody else. What that does creates all kinds of opportunities for your fellow team members and employees. And that's what any business or nonprofit should be about. We're in the business of opportunity creation so that you, as a citizen or as an employee, can optimize your potential. So it's with those thoughts, then, that we're going to be listening to our panel today and seeing what they have to say about compassion in their businesses, in their organization. So it's my job to introduce the panel. Our panelists are Paul Thompson, Tori Murden McClure, Joe Steyer, and Diane Timmering. So first we have Paul Thompson. I assume that's Paul over there, right? How you doing, buddy? Nice to see you. <laughs> Joining us from Wisconsin? Fantastic. The first step for you out of towners is he knows how to say Louisville. So that's, a, that's an indication. That's good. So Paul's here uh, appearing on behalf of his uh, partner and boss, a fellow named Junior Bridgman. Uh, Junior was, is the president of Bridgman Foods and a really great story. He played, uh, he's from East Chicago, Illinois, played basketball at the University of Louisville, NCAA, uh, I guess first team All-American, great NBA career, tremendous business person, compassionate guy uh, to work with. Uh, you see Junior on the Wendy's commercials uh, from time to time. Great civic leader. So Paul is vice president of Bridgman and he's going to address the role of compassion in the business and how Wendy's uh, looks at their business through that lens 
and particularly in Wendy's franchisees in underserved or disenfranchised neighborhoods. He's going to discuss the experience of building a workforce and a business network and the challenges and opportunities that come with that. And second we have Madam President Tori Merton McClure. She's the president of Spalding University and also famed transoceanic rower. So if any of y'all don't know about this, I embarrass her every time. Uh, this is a woman that was the first in the world to row across the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, that is a... <laughs> That's hard. We think compassion is hard. Try rowing across the ocean. Could you imagine that? After 45 minutes, I'd be ready to turn back. It took you, what, 45 days on our second trip after multiple near-death experiences. If you haven't read her book, you should read her book. Her book is called Pearl in the Storm. Right? <laughs> Great book. Very complex woman. <laughs> Tori, I say that with great admiration. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how complex she is. Uh, someday we're going to have a sculpture for Tori in the community. And so there, we, there's a guy that's got two uh, maquettes. And there's this one with, you know, really tough Tory rowing this boat, and then this big wave coming over the bow. And then there's one of Tory, the teacher, reading a book to a young child on a bench. I said, Tory, which one of these are we gonna do? Well, that's really clear. I'm thinking, well, that's the rowing the boat, right? That's what everybody knows her about all around the world. She says, no, it's me reading to the young child. That's who I am. Wow. So she's going to discuss her decision to be the first university president to sign a charter for compassion for her organization. And she's going to talk about why she did it, what the steps were that were involved in making compassion an institutional value. And then we have the tag team of Joe Steyer, who's president of Signature Healthcare and Diane Timmering, who's got one of the coolest titles in the country, and she's the Vice President of Spirituality at Signature Healthcare. You don't hear about that title very much. And so this is a company that's very intentional, a great skilled nursing facility company that's headquartered here in Louisville, that how do we enhance our customer experience through spirituality? And they're not trying to convert to anybody, it's just whatever's the best ins inside of somebody. So we're looking forward to hearing what Joanne and Diane, Joe and Diane have to say as well. So great company, we're happy to have you. So let's see how we can get rolling on this. And Phil, are you moderating? So this should be a very entertaining afternoon. Phil Marshall. Thank you. Okay, so before we get to the panel, what a delight to introduce Dr. Doty. Um, what neurosurgeon would be up smiling about all the compassionate stories we just heard right now, see? Um, if you haven't read the bio, and I promised myself I wouldn't, but I'm going to read some of it. Uh, just a couple of uh, little bullet points here. Dr. Doty's specialty is the science of compassion. He is a neurosurgeon, and he's interested in documenting the effects on the brain, the heart, and other parts of our body, I guess, of compassion. And he claims that compassion, not science, will be the influence that will lead humanity to the peak of its potential. Among a few things that he's done, he's the director of CARE, Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford, of which His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the founding benefactor. How many of us can say that one? Well, the, uh, Right. That, think about that one. <laughs> uh, he collaborates with scientists from a number of disciplines examining the neural bases for compassion and altruism. He's also a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford, as well as an inventor and entrepreneur. So he's also been the CEO of a NASDAQ company that went public in 2007, co-founder of DXTX, funded by Siemens Medical, which is not easy to get money from. 
And now uh, the current company that he's working on is Contextus, and I can't, I would have to kill you if I told, more, told you more about that one, so. Um, but one final thing, as a philanthropist, Dr. Doty supports a number of charitable organizations supporting peace initiatives and providing health care throughout the world. He also supports a variety of research, research initiatives and provided scholarships and endowed chairs at multiple universities, including his alma mater, Tulane, uh, in New Orleans. He serves on the board of a number of nonprofits, including the Dalai Lama Foundation, of which he is chairman. No further ado, let's introduce Dr. Doty and let him speak. Nobody asked me to talk about health care. I talk about compassion and business, which is sort of interesting. But uh, uh, it's really an honor to be here today. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, the mayor, Gray Henry, who's giving me a place to sleep, and to, to Sarah Harris, who's been leading me around and telling me what to do. Um, you know, <clears throat> the challenge, I think, for all of us is to look within ourselves and, number one, decide who we are, and then, once you decide who you are, how you're going to take that and how you're going to interact with others. And I think that's really what it's all about. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm going to focus on compassion and business, but really, I'm going to give you an overview of what a lack of compassion and business results in. And then look at some ways we have looked at in the context of science, myself and my colleagues, some interventions that may give us some insights for individuals how to prove, improve their own environment within themselves and hopefully allow them to lead better, fuller uh, lives. Uh, as a neurosurgeon, uh, when I'm in the operating room, and I think this echoes in some ways what has been said already, is that when something happens, and it does happen where it doesn't always go the way you want, the first thing that I do is to sit there and say, until proven otherwise, this is my fault. When you do that, first of all, it stops you from getting angry because you're going to get really mad at yourself, right? So you pause, and then you take a minute, and the thing I sit there and say, what is it that has happened here? What is it that I have not done to improve the performance of my team? Did I not tell them exactly what I was going to do? Did I not educate them? Did they know what our mission was? Did they know their responsibilities? Did I explain to them and recognize their abilities and limitations? Um, when you do that, you, it's hard to raise your voice, it's hard to throw instruments, and actually it makes people a lot happier because they know you take responsibility. And I'm done, that's it. That's my whole talk. <laughs> uh, but let's go, <laughs> I'll tell you a few more things. But you guys, these guys stole most of the thunder here. I mean, they said everything, and I'm like, well, well what am I gonna say? <laughs> Thanks, guys. But uh, I think there are some points we can uh, take from here, if I can figure out how to use this thing. Okay. Uh, so I do run the center at Stanford, and uh, there I am with His Holiness. Uh, we were having a gay old time at Stanford where he came and we talked about some of the science and compassion. On the bottom there is uh, the team of people uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with. The short fellow in the front actually is His Holiness's translator. And believe it or not, this gentleman, I, I met him, and I was talking about taking from money from the Dalai Lama. The first time I met him, he actually not only agreed to come to Stanford, but he ended up giving the largest donation he's ever given to a non-Tibetan cause for this work we're doing at Stanford, which is extraordinary. And then Jinpa, who is in the front there, who's been his translator for a quarter of a century, has spent the last three years, a week a month, at Stanford working with me. He lives in Montreal. Can you imagine? I mean, isn't, isn't that extraordinary? So what is compassion? Now, we do have a scientific term, but what I will tell you is that it's connecting with others, it's recognizing that everyone is suffering, and it's responding to that suffering with kindness and helpfulness. It's really not that hard. And what is not being compassionate? When you're not compassionate, you're not connected. You don't feel part of anything. What's extraordinary is in our country, 25% of people will tell you that they have no one to share their problems with or their pain. 
there's an extraordinary link between not feeling connected in regard to the occurrence of anxiety, depression, and actually overall health. And when you're depressed, your immune system gets depressed. When you're unhappy and disconnected and either are not compassionate or feeling compassionate, you're actually, your life expectancy has decreased. But let's look back and say, what is it that makes people thrive in their lives and what makes them happy? happy? One thing we know is it's freedom from fear. You know, we have this system within ourselves, this flight or fright, <laughs> it's not Halloween, flight or fight uh, 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 mechanism within us, which is, has been with us uh, and has been with our species as we have evolved, but it doesn't always work in the best way in the, in the modern world. And it's easy to be fearful. And when that fear, which if we were on a savanna in Africa and we're being chased by a lion, it has a purpose. It has a response. You either survive or you don't, and we're done. Unfortunately, in our modern society, that has changed a little bit. The other aspect of what allows a person to thrive, it's a feeling they can trust those around them and that they're respected. It's also a sense that at least some part of their environment, or at least the environment in which they function, they have some control. And then the most important thing, thing I think, for people in their lives is this desire for transcendence, which goes really deep within us and makes us feel that we have a purpose in our lives. And that purpose invariably has to do with an outward journey of connecting with others. And that connection with others is part and parcel of being compassionate and recognizing that we're all suffering and helping them through their journey this life. Stress, a nonspecific response of the body to any demand for change. <coughs> Job stress has been defined as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand made upon it. But you know, there's good and there's bad stress. You know, uh, Robert Sapolsky at Stanford has said, our goal in life is not to have a life without, our goal is not to have a life without stress. It's the idea of, right, of having the right amount of stress. You know, when people have nothing to strive for, when they have no motivation or drive, they're not happy. It's again, it's having the right amount of stress. And we talk about use stress or good stress. And that refers to the experiences of limited duration, which leaves a sense of exhilaration, accomplishment. And when you have the right amount of stress, you're productive and you're creative. Actually, you're happy. Bad stress or distress is when you feel overwhelmed, where you lack control, and when it's prolonged or recur recurring. And when you have that type of stress, it's emotionally draining and has a huge negative impact on how you function in your life and how you function at work. <clears throat> Again, emphasizing the aspects of good stress. It gives us this competitive edge in activities. It gives us this sense of flow in our lives, of being completely involved and being present in the moment. And it increases our cognitive abilities, actually, and our performance. So good stress, that's wonderful. It's when you're overwhelmed by stress that all the negative effects of this flight or fight response uh, demonstrate themselves. Now, you see this bear here, it says boss. That's bad stress, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and this is what happens, or what many people feel in their work environment. They don't feel like they're engaged with their work. They don't feel that they're at maximal performance. They're fearful at work. They're fearful they're gonna lose a job. They're fearful that if they express their true opinion that uh, they can't trust that that's gonna be accepted with respect. They're fearful that they don't have uh, a voice or that they're not recognized as having worth. You're just another entity that can be replaced in the right situation if you don't perform. And it's this lack of control which increases an immense amount of stress 
And one of the biggest causes of stress is a sense that you've been had too much piled on you, where you're overwhelmed. And unfortunately, in this environment where we have uh, 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 an economy which is not as vibrant as we would all like, and people have been laid off and people have given other uh, responsibilities or more responsibilities, it only increases the situation. Remember that bear there. Uh, <laughs> so this bad stress stimulates this flight or fight response, and it leads to this chronic elevation of these stress hormones, which have a profound effect, not only on mental functioning, but also on an immune function. And, you know, we have this combination of systems that, if we, again, if we head back to the prairie, you know, uh, or to the savanna, you have the situation where you have, if you will, the stressful event, it's momentary, it's, it's over, and you're back. And what are you doing? You're living in the moment, right? You're living in the moment to survive. You're not thinking about the future necessarily. You're not ruminating on the past. You're right here in the moment. And that's the best way to live. And when you live like that, your autonomic immune, or your autonomic nervous system is in balance. And you have this balance between the sympathetic nervous system, which is associated with the stress response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is actually, when it's engaged, results in a feeling of connectedness, results in a feeling of calmness, and allows you to reach your full potential. And what happens in this flight or flight response is you see all of these events occurring, but the other thing that's occurring is you're hijacking your uh, higher level of function or your executive function, and you're not engaged. What happens with this? You do not perform as well. You're thinking about other things. You're distracted, and as a result, you're not at your best within the work environment. It's extraordinary. 75% of workers today will tell you that they feel stressed at work. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the mayor is telling us, I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> now, in some ways, it's an extraordinary statement, but in other ways, it's not because the reality is we choose how we respond to the events in our lives every day, don't we? You can either wake up every day and say, I'm having the most fantastic day in the world, and it could be raining and pouring outside, and another person wakes up and says, this is horrible, I'm putting the covers over my head and I'm not getting out of bed because life is horrible. In some ways, it's, it's a choice we make, and they're tools to make you understand how, in some ways, these are choices, and when you make these right choices, it actually creates the right environment for you also to thrive. We already talked about that 25% of people will tell you that they have no one to talk to when they're stressed and pain or anxious. So I will tell you that it is my belief that it is a lack of compassion within the workplace that leads to this bad stress. And what is the cost of this lack of compassion? We have this immense amount of absenteeism, and we have something called presenteeism, where what happens is you don't want to be at work, you're unhappy, you're not engaged, but you have to be at work. So you show up, but you're not really there. So you're not being productive at all. <clears throat> when you have this type of stress, or an employee feels this type of stress, they're going to be out looking for another position because they're not happy. You're going to have decreased productivity, and you're going to have increased costs for medical care. I mean, think about it. $150 to $300 billion a year spent on stress, if you will, in the work environment. $300 billion a year. Now, when you translate this out to the number of employees, this comes out to somewhere around $2,500 to $7,500 per employee because of stress. Now imagine if you can take the tools of neuroscience, if you will, and studies 
and actually turn that around where you address some of these issues. When somebody is stressed, they have almost a 50% higher cost for health care. And when they're stressed, look what happens at the bottom. Half of the people will tell you that they're looking for another job. They don't want to take on further responsibility in the company because what's going to happen? They're going to get more stress. Or they just leave their job, even if they don't have a job that's better because they're so unhappy. Look at the health effects of this bad stress. You know, we look at anxiety disorders. We look at depression. We look at sleep disorders. Those are just the mental effects. But then what people don't appreciate is chronic stress in the workplace not only is a mental issue, it is a general health issue. One of the leading causes of sudden cardiac death is a lack of what we call <clears throat> heart rate variability. And what this is an implication of is that your parasympathetic system is being downregulated because your sympathetic system is always kicked in, releasing these hormones that are very deleterious to your health in the long term. This leads to heart attacks, leads to hypertension, leads to stroke. Then you have these other issues, and one of the things I see all day long in my practice is people with low back pain or neck pain. You know, have any of you seen a movie? It's called, um, apparently I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I think it's called Brandon. It's a guy who was, did the horse whisper. Did you ever see it? Remember this, this movie? Well, you know, he, uh, uh, Buck, Buck, that's the movie, exactly. So he does this movie, and it's interesting, the movie he says, you know, because he's, he goes all around the country to deal with troubled horses. What he says is he says, you know, my problem isn't the troubled horses, it's the troubled people. That's the problem here. You know, I see people all day long with back and neck pain, and, they, you know, I throw these x-rays up, and is there an abnormality there? Yes. Is that their problem? No. Their problem is that they have transferred stress to their back, their neck, other parts of their bodies because they do not have a healthy outlet or they do not know how to deal with this type of stress. So it's not just depression, it's not just anxiety. You see the cardiac effects, but you also see this plethora of other effects that have a huge impact on healthcare cost. What happens to performance in the context of this type of bad stress? And, you know, we can, I can quote the literature all day long, but there are huge biases in your ability to make decision, appro decisions appropriately. It weakens your ability to process and appropriately analyze situations. And it, there's the statement, it impacts negatively on disease trajectories. What does that mean? If you get ill or have a health condition, it is only going to make it worse, and it's going to make it prolonged. It's not surprising that when people are stressed, they're less productive. And it's interesting, 33% of the people say they're overworked, and as a result, they make more mistakes. Now look at the cost of all of these things. And look at the effect of, of loyalty in a company. Again, not surprising. Low levels of job satisfaction, how can you commit to an organization if you're unhappy being there? If you can't tell your best friend, I want you to come to work for my company, what is that saying about you? If it, an employee is not connected to the organization and its values, or at least he does not perceive or she does not perceive that it exemplifies their own values, what kind of commitment are they going to have to the goals of your organization? or the quality of the product. They're not. And look at the interesting point at the bottom. If you are unhappy, it is a perfect situation for you to, st stop make it, to start making bad decisions. Because if you feel that the values within your company are such that it is telling you that they don't care about you, why should you care about them? And what stops you from stealing from the company, for not being interested in quality control, for potentially creating products that aren't safe for individuals. And all of these issues have been played out over and over and over again. 
And of course, you know, for many of us, what is happening in our home reflects our work. And work, for many people, is how they identify themselves in their life. But look what happens in people's life situations. They bring their home to work oftentimes. 35% of people with children under the age of 18, their home situation is having an impact on their work. If the work environment doesn't give people a sense that it is a caring environment and that they understand maybe that you have to leave work early, you have a sick child, what does that do? Especially if you can't afford care to take care of that child. <clears throat> Obviously, in, in what we call the blue collar working environment, you know, another thing that can decrease stress or a feeling of isolation or that you're uncared for is, you know, you're in this environment where a lot is demanded of you. It's an unsafe environment in some ways. You're working with heavy equipment or it's a dangerous environment. Clearly, that can uh, lead to significant stress. And obviously, in the more white-collar environments, it's interpersonal relationships. It's not fear of being hit by a machine or being injured by a machine, unless that you see the, the, your boss as a machine. Uh, and then the other issue, of course, is life skills that you don't have put you at more risk to be stressed. You know, when you're extraordinarily self-critical or you feel because of the environment you're in that you can't handle the job or you feel you don't have, you're not being, your dignity is re not recognized, you become self-critical and this of course leads to increased stress and decreased work performance and it's a, it's a horrible cycle. You know, we look at these issues of job satisfaction. Now, of course, you can look at poor pay, poor compensation, etc. But this doesn't necessarily get rid of job dissatisfaction. Right? Well, I, it doesn't get rid of... Let me start again. It does not necessarily give job satisfaction. All of those things will help you uh, uh, increase your sense of being valued on some level, but it's not going to give you what you really want. Because what we really want is to be engaged with our employer. We want it to allow us to reach our greatest potential and be passionate about something. And this is what happens on the right. You're recognized for your abilities. There are opportunities for advancement. You have a relationship of trust with the management. And, and it's not that we're all perfect and, and don't make mistakes, but it's when it, you, you do make those mistakes, you're not punished in the sense of being fired. You're educated. Because, you know, in most of the environments I have been in, as an example in healthcare, people don't make mistakes because they want to, generally speaking. They don't make mistakes to hurt people. They make mistakes, and they're still human beings. We have to always keep that in mind. The key here is then how do you find the right balance between the good stress and the bad stress? And there are some techniques which I'm briefly going to talk about. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to go into them. But this is ultimately the key is how this balance between the parasympathetic nervous system, which allows you to be calm and relax. I think a smart businessman knows that 
you cannot pay a person enough when compared to someone who's passionate about their work. It doesn't matter what you pay somebody. A passionate person who is engaged with the company, recognizes its values, wants to be there, feels respected, is given dignity, they will work harder for you, they want to be on your team, and in fact, it doesn't matter what you pay them. Oftentimes they'll say, listen, I'm, I'm perfectly fine, it's extraordinary. And this is, passion should be one's business. Where they're engaged without fear, there's a sense of trust within the organization, they feel a sense of control. We talked about this transcendence. Work has meaning. Now some environments, you know, if you're making a widget and you show up to make a widget every day, it's hard to make that sexy or fantastic to say, I make a widget. Now obviously if that widget's an incredible part of, let's say, an F-16, or maybe that's not a, bad, a good example, but if it's in, <laughs> of a life-saving device, let's say that. That's one thing. But sometimes you just are making widgets that may not have a whole impact. But the thing, though, is that it's still the values of the leadership of the company. And the other thing, though, that will engage people, if you don't have that sense that there's this value so much in what you're doing, there are other ways to give that to individuals. If the organization says, you know, yes, we make this widget, but you know what we do with part of our profits? We help our community. And in fact, what we do is we want you to help our community as well because we recognize the importance of that relationship in the community. When, it is amazing when people volunteer, and now we're seeing more and more organizations which actually give time for individuals to volunteer. There was a study that was done that looked at people over the age of 65 as an example, and it compared people who volunteer mm -hmm. to those who don't volunteer. Life expectancy was two times in the people that volunteered, with one exception. Do you know what the exception was? It was if the volunteering was to impress somebody, and it wasn't authentic. Engagement has to be authentic. People have to sense that this is real. As the mayor was talking about, this can't just be a slogan. It just can't be something you throw up on an advertisement to impress people. There has to be true, authentic engagement and compassion because very quickly, the employees will see through it and any advantage you had will be gone and in fact, it'll exacerbate the situation I would submit to you. You know, one of the things that is happening and, and that is science-driven is this concept of emotional intelligence. Have you all heard of that? So Danny Goldman's a, a good friend of mine. And you know, one of the things about my job is, and, and actually I'm at extraordinarily selfish, because I get to hang around with some of the most extraordinary people in the world, and that's really why I'm doing this. It's not for any other reason. I just get to hang around with great people. But, but you know, I was talking to the Dalai Lama about this, and I said, <clears throat> we were talking about uh, being compassionate. And of course, the reality is, when you're compassionate to others, it comes back to you. When you're authentically caring and concerned about others in terms of your own health benefits. So His Holiness says to me, he says, well, that's one of the only instances where it's okay to be selfish. Because when you care for others, it benefits you as much, if not more. So I am confessing to you that I'm very selfish. So emotional intelligence, this is this concept that uh, uh, was popularized by Danny Goleman's book, it's the ability to monitor one's feelings and emotions when you're feeling stress and to discriminate uh, among them and to use this information to guide your actions. As an example, how often are, are we struck with something and what if we have a knee-jerk reaction to respond instead of taking a second? And this is the, the technique I was mentioning to you when I'm in the operating room and something happens where I point to myself first. What that does is it stops my blood pressure from going up like this because <laughs> I don't want to be mad at myself, right? And accept that responsibility. Uh, uh, but it makes you slowly think through things. And then the aspects of this are the intrapersonal within yourself, this knowledge of your internal state. What is it that you really want? Managing your impulses and emotions. And then how do you take these, this understanding to facilitate your own goals? 
And then the interpersonal between people. When you look at other people, you're better at assessing their feelings if you incorporate this concept of emotional intelligence. And, it, and your social skills get sharpened and you can understand what is expected and also what you can expect from other people. So at the end of the day, you have improved work performance, improved leadership skills, and increasing the ultimately what we all want, which is happiness. And it's interesting that these emotional competencies, emotional intelligence, is twice as important as intellect and expertise. And of course, here is uh, uh, Dan Goldman's book. The other aspect of what we have learned from science is that we can do mind training. We can train our minds, this concept of neuroplasticity. We are not stuck as we were born, if you will. Each of us has potential, a genetic potential, that frankly in most of us is not maximized. And we have training, and their trainings exist based on thousand year old traditions, contemplative traditions, and at Stanford, we have actually secularized those, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But what does this training allow you to do, this mental type of training? It allows you to have attention and focus. It allows you to be here and now. What happens to most of us? In fact, some of you sitting here going, should I better check, I'll take a look at my black pair there? Somebody's got this emergency email has to be answered right now, right? <laughs> You're not here. In fact, uh, do you know, all of you know Arianna Huffington? So I was with Arianna Huffington uh, at an event, and I was sitting next to her, not because, now I've gotten to know her, but not because I knew her, I was just seated next to her. And the whole event. Now, this is an event that's actually a pretty significant event. The Dalai Lama's receiving an award. We're right up there in front. And I, in two hours, I don't think she looked up more than three times. Now, I'm not trying to be critical of Ariana, so none of you tell her that I said this or used her as an example. But my point is, it, these techniques, though, and in fact, I suggested this to her. <laughs> these techniques allow you to be here and now, not thinking about what you should have done or could have done or didn't do or what's happening next week. Because the most emotionally rich parts of our lives are the interactions we're having right now. And when you're distracted from that, it takes away from that. And then this idea of this non-judgmental awareness. You know, it's so unfortunate that we hear this stuff that goes through our minds, and a lot of it's self-critical. To be able to just take in what's happening, but not make a judgment about it. And these techniques allow us to be relaxed, alert, and again, this allows for, if you will, resetting that thermometer, that imbalance we have between our autonomic and nervous and, and uh, our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and be able to live without fear. And of course, the master of that is uh, John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, and, you know, study after study now, I think over a thousand studies, show the ability of mind training to decrease stress in one's life. And this can be extraordinarily beneficial uh, at work. And then of course, have any of you seen this book yet? So Ming is, a, uh, in fact, he's one of my benefactors at, at Stanford. Uh, he has a lecture uh, ship named after him. Uh, and he's worked closely with me in our work there. But he's written this book called Search Inside Yourself. He was one of Google's earliest employees. And this is a technique that they have incorporated in the work environment and other organizations in which it is a combination of the skills learned with emotional intelligence and mindfulness training to decrease work stress and increase performance. And it's having actually quite an amazing impact. And then we have at Stanford, I call it Mindfulness Plus, but this is focused more on compassion. And actually I was, I was actually amazed because we were at dinner the other night, and actually three people at the dinner were in the process of taking this course at Stanford. So I come to Louisville to see people who are taking our course. So, uh, <laughs> but the power of this course 
I believe is extraordinary and it's really changing people's lives. This is now being incorporated into the healthcare environment. It's an eight week course and it teaches you a couple things. One is the mindfulness part, the attention, being present, non-judgmental self-awareness. But the other part is giving you techniques to be less self-critical, to have compassion for yourself. And then the other challenge is all of us have our circle or our in-group, which we connect with. Typically, it's people who look like us, who act like us, who have the same backgrounds as us. But that's not the world, is it? The world is composed of a lot of people who don't look like us, think like us, like this. But the one thing, every one of those people is a human being. And the other thing is, fundamentally, every one of them wants the same thing, and that's happiness. And that happiness is translated by security. It's, it's translated into uh, caring for their families. <clears throat> it's translated by having a life that is worthwhile. And so we work very hard, and part of this is ultimately to increase in it, uh, our in-group, expand it outward. And it is hard. It doesn't happen overnight. And I will not tell you that this training, tomorrow you're going to be Gandhi or you're going to be the Dalai Lama. Maybe 10 weeks, but not eight weeks. <laughs> So being compassionate, connected to others, we talked about this increase in longevity, decreasing stress, anxiety, and depression, and increased levels of a sense of happiness. And so this is the compassionate workplace. <laughs> Not where you're being chased by the bear, but you're being loved by the bear. Thank you. Remember the bear. There you go. Okay, so we're going to begin now our panel discussion if we can. So do you all want to come on forward? And uh, Kevin, a little advice. So we want Paul to start. Would that be how we would do this? All right, so if I could, each panelist is going to uh, have time to speak. So we're going to try to, if we can, contain it to about eight to ten minutes, is that going to be possible? Okay. There you go, okay, all right. Do we want to bring a mic over to them somehow? Oh, okay, all right. Well, good afternoon. I'm really honored to be here today, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I'm the hamburger maker. I get to follow the brain surgeon. So, uh, so it's really uh, it, pretty humorous. But I, I want to, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm fortunate and blessed. You know, I, I work in a terrific organization. I've been uh, uh, with Junior Bridgman since day one. I was the first employee that he hired. And I want to tell you from that point in time, that's the last time I've ever felt like I worked for him. And I want you to think about that as, as I talk today. Because really, um, what he's done is he's created a culture where we work with him, not for him, and it's not his, it's ours. And you know, you look at the stress levels and all, we're in a restaurant business. Probably most of you have eaten at one of our establishments. Hopefully it was good. <laughs> But sometimes it's not, and there's a lot of stress, and it's a stressful business. And Junior has set up his business to where really what's important, and what's important to us, our pyramid at our company is turned upside down. So who's at the top? The guest. Who's after the guest? The other guest, the internal guest, our internal and external. Then it works down. You know, when you work down to the levels of your office staff, you're all, and at the very bottom, the very, very bottom is the executive team that I'm a part of, the juniors at the, at the very tipping point. And that's a, a real change in corporate America. 
I mean, that's not how most companies do business. We also try to do things in a way that, you know, to relieve that stress, because I understand stress is, stress is a killer, distress isn't bad. You know, we, we do things in a way that if you have a problem and you share the problem, it's our problem. And, you know, I came from the corporate side, uh, worked in corporate America at a young age. Um, you know, when I met Junior, we were a lot younger. <laughs> uh, but, you know, what ends up happening is that takes away a lot of the stress factor because we are really working on what's wrong, what do we need to, what, it's, a, it's a problem, it's our problem, it's not your problem. You can go home at night, you can sleep well, and we'll go back and we'll attack that problem. Um, so that's, that's kind of our culture. But I, I want to tell you how we started. We started with five restaurants, and you, you're going to hear me say we and our a lot, so I, I want you to realize that I'm talking for our organization, our leadership team. You know, we started with five stores that nobody wanted, to be honest with you. They were in the central city, and um, the volumes were extremely low, and the people were not taken care of. Not that anyone did it on purpose, don't get me wrong, but we came in with a different type of philosophy and culture and worked with our people. And those five restaurants that were extremely low volume, today are some of the highest volume stores in our organization, with some of the best leaders in our organization. And that was the spearhead for uh, our company to grow and for Junior's business to develop and grow. So we always, in, in all of our marketplaces uh, here in Louisville, Kentucky, um, you know, we have over 50 restaurants here. And we really try to let our people know that when they come to work, you know, we're here for them. You know, we're real big on servant leadership. You know, we're here to serve our employees and our customers and our staffs. And, um, you know, we, those employees, some days in our business, um, when they come to work, that's the best place they go all day. And it's just what it is. We try to get them when they hit the door. You know, we're a family. We're in this together. And that, that has been a real springboard for our culture and for um, our success as a company. The, the other thing we do is, you know, we look to develop leaders in the community. We look for leaders, and we don't let them seek us out. We go after them. And, um, you know, we have a, a uh, program, you know, we, we do programs that help our employees. We have our own charity within our company, because there's a lot of people that make decisions where they need help. And it's funded by the employees. And all the employees contribute to their, uh, from their paycheck. And we have a board, and that board, um, they'll submit what their hardship is. We'll read it. We'll meet on it. We'll make a decision. It's a regular, just like any other board. And we help our people. You know, we help our people. And there is no payback. It's, we are, you know, talk about being compassionate. These people are in trouble. We're the only place they have to go. So we really try to give back and teach our people that, you know, we're, on, we're only on this earth a short period of time. So let's work together and let's be successful together. And when we can help each other, let's help each other. Um, the other thing that, you know, that we see is that people, young people make poor decisions and it's different than when we were growing up. Um, we didn't have all these credit card companies, especially a few years ago that were going after you. People get bills, they didn't know how to deal with it, they never, you know, we are in the process right now. Um, we are piloting a program, you know, all the kids and all of us, you're talking about Blackberries and everybody's used to this gaming piece. So we are doing a, we're in the process of implementing, really it'll start next week, a game for, to teach our young people how to be fiscally responsible. And you think about that, I mean, it's, it's pretty neat. This company came to Junior and said, we want you to do this, and we saw it, and we're like, man, this is our charity. The biggest problem we have is that our people have made poor decisions financially, and we have to help them get back into the, get, get their lives back together. So this gaming piece is really cool, I mean, it really is. It's where the employees, they, they earn points by making good decisions, by learning how to bank, by learning how to use a credit card, by learning, and it escalates from that to, to to getting a mortgage. And it's, it's really something we're, we're really excited about. 
And that's something that we're going to take across our whole system. We have 12,000 employees. Um, we have 300 restaurants in 12 different states. We have over 50 restaurants here. To be compassionate in our mind is to help those employees be extremely successful. Last story, because I know somebody's getting ready to go like this, and I understand. Um, 25 years ago, we had a manager to work for us. And he was really fired up about things, and Junior met him. Junior gives him a lot of grief. They play, they, they get along very, very well. But he had a dream, and his dream is that he wanted to be a marketing person. And he begged for his job. I mean, seriously, he said, God, please, just give me a chance, give me an opportunity, the company was just growing. Yesterday, he did, uh, he's the, he went back to college, didn't have a degree, got his degree, worked full time. He's our vice president of marketing. Um, he buys media in six different states. Yesterday, he gave a presentation. I'll tell you his name. His name is Andre Bynum. He gave a presentation here in Louisville on social media that just blew people away. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And it was applauded. And I, I'll tell you, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, our company and Junior were able to give people opportunities to achieve their goals and more. And that's what, that's what our company is all about. And um, once again, you know, it's all about servant leadership. It's all about our customers, both our internal and our external. And it's about serving great food when you come to our establishments. And if you don't, if we don't do that, you need to let us know. But once again, I appreciate and I'm honored and blessed to be here. And thank you very much for your time. And I'm glad I had got a chance to follow the brain surgeon and, and what you, your whole comments today are what we deal with every day. So thank you. Thank you very much. So there will be some among you who think, you know, why is an educator here talking about compassionate business? And well, if you're at Stanford, maybe education is not a business, but when you're on the scrappy end of the higher education gene pool, it's business, right? You gotta, you gotta make ends meet. So, um, sorry, sorry for the. Um, so I've been sitting here debating whether I tell you the lofty reasons Spalding became the world's first compassionate university, or whether I tell you the truth. <laughs> And I, I think the truth is just uh, uh, even a little more entertaining. Uh, I went to Divinity School at Harvard with a gentleman named Anil Singh Molares. And Anil left Harvard and went on to become a vice president at Microsoft. I left Harvard and ran a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky at 32nd and Broadway. And uh, Neil retired to uh, help with the Compassionate Action Network and I kept working. <laughs> And as they were working to create compassionate cities, they heard this rumor about this um, complicated mayor who, uh, complex mayor, who, um, <laughs> who was talking about compassion. And, and Anil said, hey, when you're in Louisville, look up, look up this friend of mine, and she's, he called me an eccentric genius. <laughs> I'm not sure that's any better, but, um, and I think the story of um, businesses becoming involved with the Charter of Compassion are not unlike the story of Spalding. The first time someone comes through your office talking about compassion, you say, get out of my office, I have things to do, be gone. And I heard Howard Bihar tell this story, he's um, ran Starbucks for 20 years, and he's like, yeah, they came, talk about compassion, blah, 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 get out of my office. And I heard stories of other institutions of higher education that did that same sort of thing. But there was a second visit through Spalding, and the second time through, I didn't say, get out of my office. Because between the first visit and the second visit, I thought about all the things that Spalding does. We were founded almost 200 years ago by the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth. Actually, it wasn't an institution of higher learning. It was a little log cabin schoolhouse. We cheat with our founding date like everybody else does. And, um, but the Sisters of Charity were all about service to the community. And the, the ancient definition of compassion is passion is that for which you are willing to suffer. And come means with, to suffer with another. Well, the Sisters were all about suffering with another and the nuts and bolts work of alleviating that suffering. And um, 
But the truth of the story was, there was this rumor that Stanford University was working on becoming a charter for compassion. I mean, a, a compassionate university. And, uh, you know, if Spalding could beat Stanford, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that was part of it. And the other part of it is, is Spalding, even though we're almost 200 years old, we get confused with this little upstart called Sullivan. And I figured, OK, if I want to get confused with an S university, I want it to be Stanford <laughs> that we get confused with. And um, by rights, the University of Louisville, if it was going to be a Louisville institution, the University of Louisville should have been the world's first compassionate university. Um, they had this little problem, though. They're all about data-driven education, and I'm all, all for that, absolutely. But they, they thought if they couldn't measure compassion, they couldn't do it. <laughs> well, I'm all for putting compassion into a pie chart. And if you could put it in a pie chart, I would have a piece. <laughs> um, and it, it's balding. Because we're on the scrappy end of higher education, we don't have to measure it. We can just do it. <laughs> and then we can measure it later. Um, because we can go out and we can prove it works and then we can write it down and like, see how smart we were? We have done research now on how well it works. Um, so there were some hiccups along the way, like when we were first designated the world's first compassionate university. It's just laughable, right? Because it is, it's laughable, right? <laughs> like first it's Spalding and then it's like, Human beings have been talking about and fighting about and discussing compassion for at least 2,500 years. The oldest version of the golden rule of which human beings are commonly aware comes from Confucius 2,500 years ago, 500 years before Christ. And um, he said, do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. Hillel picks up essentially that same version um, in Judaism. Christianity says it to the positive, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. compassionate mind with compassionate heart, then we call you the Dalai Lama, or you know, we remember your name for thousands of years. So what's happening at Spalding? Well, compassion has been become part of our strategic plan. The faculty want to embed it in every portion of our curriculum. Um, I taught a course in compassion with our dean of students. It was comical. Um, I need the dean of students to translate pop culture for me. I was pop culturally challenged. I have been forever. I, when I was a teenager, I had a crush on John Quincy Adams. <laughs> and it, it was an amazing course, because here we had the dean of students, who is a male, who gets compassion at his heart level. I am a female. I get comp uh, compassion with my head. Not so much with my heart, like, you know, I rode a boat alone across the Atlantic. I don't even like people. <laughs> um, but doing it together was a great thing. And the final exam, the mayor's going to love this, the final exam was to take the students to 4th and Muhammad Ali and to read Thomas Merton's Epiphany. 
and to ask those students to watch the people moving around, and then they went back to campus and wrote their final exam. It was a great course. Another course was on mindfulness and nature. The, um, the capstone of that course was the students had to go camping with the president, <laughs> which was um, a mind-altering experience for me. Um, that's not meant to be funny. Uh, I, uh, I tend to camp with experts in camping. And these students, of course, I said, if, you know, if you have me along, it's going to rain. So we were supposed to leave on a Friday night. It was pouring rain. We just had everyone come to my house. And we told the students, don't buy stuff. You know, Tori will loan you whatever you need. So the students came to my house. One woman was wearing garbage bags, because that was her solution for rain gear. And we said, bring what you would bring for food for a weekend. And a different woman had um, a sack of Subway sandwiches. And for breakfast, a, you know, one of those cups with Fruit Loops with a tin foil on top. And it, for me, was eye-opening. And, uh, you know, I had enough Gore-Tex to outfit the whole gang. And we went out into the, we ended up camping in Ina Brown Bond's side yard. Um, and it was fabulous. It was the first time many of these students had ever spent a night out. And so that mindfulness in nature, away from the blackberries, away from other stuff. So the last, uh, you know, presidents are supposed to brag about their institutions. The other thing we did when we were trying to, you know, document, put it in a pie chart, that compassion thing, we decided to write down all the community service, public service, practicum hours, internship hours that our students did. We have 2,500 students at Spalding. Last year our students did 1.16 million hours of service in this community. We probably did that last year and the year before and the year before, but just never occurred to us to write it down until we had to document compassion. And then our last thing as we struggle, I think as a city and um, a community, is how do we make compassion real and concrete? And one of the things I struggle with is um, I'm aware that we have lots of people in jail in our community, and they're in jail not because they're dangerous, they're in jail because we're mad at them. And it costs more to keep somebody in jail than it does to send them to Spalding University. And jail usually lasts longer than college. Um, and so Spalding has become quite serious about uh, programming and restorative justice, restorative practices, which I think is a path to us. If I could take another 30 seconds, I am a true believer because I used a restorative practice with my board of trustees last Friday. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever done, and it was probably one of the most, um, we made progress that would have taken us years otherwise. So. Good afternoon. I would like to ask for atonement, thinking it back at 7 a.m., the woman I yelled at who cut me off in my car, I had no compassion whatsoever for her. Anyway, it's the conviction of compassion day, isn't it? Um, Joe Steyer and I are so honored and delighted to be here with you. We represent Signature Healthcare. Uh, long, we have 74 nursing home uh, long-term care facilities in six states. and. I just wanted to, to start with, I love what Reverend Campbell said. I don't know if you saw her presentation at lunch, but we had a dangerous dream. Joe and I had a dangerous dream. And that dangerous dream was to bring God in the workplace, to bring the spiritual into the workplace. And let me encourage each of you in this audience, because I think Dangerous Dream is so powerful in that pursuit of passion and who you are, and to truly embrace the essence of who you are and the essence of your being, is each one of you are embodied with that dangerous dream. So do not let fear, do not let fear rustle it away from you. Because, you know, we started, we started small. We started with a lot of skepticism. You can't do that. There's no crying in baseball. You can't do that. Come on, that was funny. Just, thank you. you can't do that. We had so, you know, we had a lot of skepticism. But one of the early things that we did, and Mayor, you touched on this, is we, 
we took it to our people in the field, right? The most vulnerable among us, our elderly population, the fragile, the vulnerable, the hurting, the, the, the sad, our, our, our residents, if you will, our patients and our stakeholders. And we said, we give you permission to be spiritual, to be who you are, to embrace who you are. And they started plugging in because most of us are asked to leave our spiritual skin at the door in the workplace and in the work environment. And we, we were able to roll out uh, the, the, the framework and the scaffolding for them to begin to plug in. So really the voice of desire for this, for the sacred fire started in the field. And, and it overturned, right, Mayor? It started to overturn the skepticism and the people who said you couldn't do it because it started to have an impact. Anything you want to say on that? My well, partner. Well, and, and to give you all a little bit of roots, I was blessed um, to come back to Louisville two years ago when we were talking about the whole launch. And so I, the timing of coming back and growing up here, I grew up as a, uh, my mom, had, we had five sisters in the West End, and my mom couldn't have kids. and, my, and Nobody had kids. We had all adopted kids came out of the St. George Ranch. So we're all kind of adopted eclectically. So we were very confused children. And so, you know, we didn't, we didn't understand genetic family. We just knew family from like a collective sense of brothers and sisters. And you know, we kind of we were trained them as kids. And uh, my dad was, a, was a, a big union bricklayer and built a lot of apprenticeship program in the West End. So we dealt with a lot of racial tension as children. You know, my, my father was very quick to appoint to me to never see color. And so when I was growing up, I didn't really understand stuff that I saw as a kid. And so um, um, about eight years ago, had a really sick child almost die. And if you ever had a sick child, it's the worst thing to go through, everybody agree? And so I remember, um, you know, the doctor kept saying, Lou's going to die. And, you know, we were, we were living in this NICU. And I moved to, I moved to Ron McDonald House. And every morning, we'd get to hold hands with other people, you know, in the mornings. And we didn't know them. We became really close, you know. But when somebody's child passed away that day, you would just get to your knees and cry. And you could see the parents' eyes in the moment happened. And they would say, hey, we're going to throw the ashes off the pier today in Fort Myers Beach. And I remember, like, you'd see the life, you know, life string sitting in front of you every day watching it. So I had this kind of spiritual conversion. I had a lot of time to pray. So I ended up reading the Book of Mormon. I read everything I could read, trying to find God. And I grew up Catholic. But I read everything I could find to find God somewhere in the search. And then during the process, um, you know, God the witness, we had about 1,150 prayers come in for Luke when he was fighting for his life. There were days where I thought for sure we're going to bury him. You know, I, I was going to lose my marriage. It, it was just, it's the worst thing to go through. And, but I was president of the company, and I think that I got favoritism treatment because I thought I got more prayers, more attention. And I started thinking about how do you create miracles? And I realized, you know, in, in the power of prayer, interfaith prayer, not Catholic prayer or any faith prayer, you can create miracles, you can manifest in reality. And so in that experience, um, Luke went, I went out one night and, and cut this cup of the God that would change my life. I had to kill my prior self to be a new person, um, to, to make this conversion. And it was hard because I had an ego, kind of competitive person, and changed that. And then Luke went through a healing, and, and at the end I knew that if he would have passed away, I think I would have got divorced, I think I would have been a bitter person, I think my whole life was going to unravel. And I remember just praying, you know, for God to hear me. And I always thought there was 1,100 prayers that healed Luke. So then when I got done, I had this thing called survival guilt. And, I, you know, if you ever go to Cyber Bill where you feel guilty, like, why would you survive and nobody else and your kids? So then, in my life, I still what I kept thinking, what does CNA at Citra Healthcare get the same thing? You know, would every employee that worked for me have the same experience? So then we said, we've got to build it out so every employee, all 12,000, had the exact same experience that I had. Because we didn't know if it was, it was 1,087. We didn't know the exact number of prayers that took it. We just knew that, that when the prayer happened, things changed. And so I realized, you know what, I'm going to make sure if you work for Citra Healthcare, um, it's a brotherhood and sisterhood, but everybody had the same experience. All the resources I got that I thought were privileged resources were passed on to people. That's kind of how we started, in a sense, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and I mean, let me tell you a few tenets we based it on, right? That still small voice says, you know, base it on, you know, bring the spiritual, bring, you know, that internal soul into the workplace. Well, you have to have some tenets. You have to have a platform. And so... The truth is we based it on the power of, um, of unconditional love. To be honest, I mean, it's the sanctity of respect and the power of love that has moved the mountains of this program. It's part of the fabric of who we are as a culture, as a signature nation, as a revolution to change the landscape of long-term care forever. Um, it's, it's the right to worship or not to worship. All are welcome. It's interfaith. Uh, you get to be who you are. It's very important to know, though, we've created this, this, this 
uh, strong educational piece where if you're Southern Baptist versus, you know, free will Baptist, and I promise you I have learned there is a difference, right? But you get to be who you are if you're Shia Sunni Muslim, if you're Orthodox uh, or Reformed Jewish. I mean, you get to be who you are. It is not watered down. We just respect the person, um, you know, next to you. And what we have found is that, you know, the thread of, of likeness is much greater and broader than the differences. You know, there's so much beauty in servanthood and volunteerism and, um, and, and uh, tithing that runs, it's a common thread through Christianity and Judaism and, and Islam. So the power, for example, right? And what about the beautiful reflective and meditation of, of Buddhism? So we have all learned so much and uh, we have, you know, we've grown it, you know, we've, we've, in the early days, I mean, right, we're in a for-profit business. We've grown the largest for-profit spirituality department. So in the early days, of course, you're gonna have to look at the ROI, but we were seeing the retention piece. We were seeing, um, we were seeing customer and family satisfaction. You put your family member in a nursing home, you're gonna have some guilt, some regret. We're dealing with family conflict. So, um, you know, we, we, sh we started looking at the ROI early. We, and we, we saved a woman from suicide at one of our buildings in Lexington in the early days with our first part-time chaplain, Jesse Baldridge, who's actually here today. So, so the ROI then grew from a part-time chaplain army and now we're 80 strong. And just to kind of wrap up too, because I want to give you a bunch of, you know, corporate culture, but, but I think what's interesting to me is that when I travel, people say, you know, first of all, I hated the workplace as a kid. I, I thought we were gonna see the end, and I pray to God we would see the end of the Western Command Center from a business model. So I felt like that was gonna blow up anyway because the CEO worship days were gonna end. You could see it almost coming. And so I, I knew I would be in a more meaningful working place anyway. And I don't think I realized how fast transparency was gonna hit the workplace, you know, which, which was really a great thing for all because the workplace was built, I think, in a lot of um, conflict theory. I think it was a lot of falseness in the workplace historically. So I've always kind of prayed for the transparency to come out of that and the forgiveness of it. And today, what's interesting about it is, I'll be at a conference, I'll say, Joe, how did y'all have another record year? And in all the time, last year, we, we spent $4 million on spirituality, which is a big number. You know, we you started about, with zero. But, you know, it's, it's, it's 80 people, it's a lot, of, a lot of funding, and yet, you know, there's tons of healthcare cuts. There's, everything's tough today. But yet, you always, when, you, when you do the right thing, you always, your bottom line always grows. You can't always come back and do a, a Kronzberg Alpha or do some statistical battle and say, here's the money for sure. But you're, you're, I've always been amazed how much it's grown, our, our value of our company. And I feel like I've never had to pay for it. It's always, it's always been paid out in, in the prosperity of the work. And a couple of comments, I want to say thanks for being here today. And I've loved your talk so much. And, I, and we have great respect for Junior, one of the great leaders growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but but Tori also did something for me. Um, originally, our goal was we wanted to get rid of um, corporate arrogance. It was one of our goals. So I thought, you know, one time there was I had 15 executives on my team, and when I took over the company years ago, and I thought they were arrogant. So I rented a bus. I lived on a bus for like two and a half months. I mean, including weekends. I made them live on a bus for 70 days, thinking they'd all quit. So I started in South Florida, and my, my chairman said, Joe, if you take over, um, only ground rule is you can't fire anybody, but, but it's your company to run. So I feel well. I thought about how I do it. So I rented a bus for you know for 20 grand and traveled a bus with bunk beds. We had you know no exposed feet, you know no alcohol, you know, number two tokens. I mean it, it was living the bus for seven days. But when I got to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I had one employee left. So I realized they really didn't want to live the mission vision. So so when I came back to Louisville, um, I asked Tori if she would um, make sure every executive in our company could walk the talk. So they were the one that became our CNA partner. So everybody in our company is going through this you know certified nursing assistant, and a lot of them are threatened to quit. Um, they're scared to touch a dying person. They're scared to put their hands on people going through these amazing experiences. And she's been our partner the whole time with that. It's been an incredible success for us. And I know, you know, that we felt like to lead the country, we had to know the work, you know, and so we've been really going back to learn the work. And I want to thank you for that great partnership because it's been a big win for us. And, and I think, Mayor, you've done a great job. I you know, love you, the time you came here and your vision, obviously, hot for us. You know, we've been friends for a long time, love your all's mission. So just a quick story about us. I think that if we invest in spirituality, me and Diane will have uh, lunches every once a month on Fridays, and we'll have 20, 30 companies coming in saying, I want to put God in the workplace. I'm going to start now. I'm going to do a part-time chaplain. Whatever small step you can make, um, it'll build, and it'll prosper, it'll keep building itself. It's just that first step's the hardest. And my first step, the board fought me. It was a very difficult time to fund it. But $4 million later, I've never paid for it. 
when, and God, there are many of you that do attend, I'm so glad you brought that up, our God in the Workplace forums or Spirituality in the Workplace. If you'd like to attend, we'd love to have you. All are welcome. We talk about the fears of it and, and you know, the early days of the HR and the legal piece. So you just let us know. You're more than welcome to be, uh, you know, a, a part of it. And we're so, again, thank you for this opportunity and God bless. Thank you.